send a special welcome to all of our people at Hamilton Mill and Midtown Campus. Let's welcome them as they join us live at our 11 o'clock service. We're glad to have you. Normally on Father's Day, we have live preaching at every campus, but uh, this weekend we're kind of flipping it around. Uh, we're doing something a little bit unique, a little different, uh, because I've asked my wife to preach on Father's Day. And I know that's so unusual, you usually don't have the wife preach on Father's Day, but I started thinking, you know what, fathers need a day off <laughs> every once in a while. But for those of you that are not aware of this, you may be new to Victory, every summer, both Colleen and I take a little bit of a, a break in the summer because of the grind of the year. Usually after preaching for a whole year of four services on the weekend, we need a little break. And this, this summer, I'm taking a little extended break because I've started a book, another book, called One. We're going from 10 to one. And uh, this book is very important to the heart of this church because it's about reconciling culture. And it's designed not just for the church. Tim was designed for the church. This book is designed for the world. And so this is a little broader perspective. And so I, I realized I can't do sermons every weekend and write a book at the same time. So I need to take a season for a couple of, you know, several weeks to get this done because August the 25th, we are gathering together on Stone Mountain for a celebration <laughs> called One Race. For those of you that are new finding this out, we're gathering, hundreds of churches are gathering together at Stone Mountain. Pastors are coming together. We're believing for about 30,000 people on the lawns of Stone Mountain where the Ku Klux Klan originally started. And we're gonna pray against the spirit of religion and racism in our city. We're gonna gather as churches and come together and share what it means to reconcile culture. And so this book is kind of strategic in that process. So y'all be praying for me as I write this book, amen? While I'm doing that, uh, we're gonna have, you'll have several pastors from our staff speaking this summer. Uh, a couple weeks you're gonna have Sam Chan, Dr. Sam Chan will be here. Uh, we've got some thoroughbreds in the stable here at Victory. And the Lord said to me in the summer, you need to let the thoroughbreds run. And so last week we had some new preaching. We had Darius Dunstan here at the Norcross campus and did an awesome job. I'm in Ireland watching this and I'm thinking, that's Darius. He's never preached in our main campus one time and he looks like he's been preaching forever. And that's just the anointing that God has placed on this, on this house because this house is not about one preacher, it's about Jesus, amen? It's about everybody be, just cooperating with Jesus. And so we also have another thoroughbred, actually she's a filly, and she, she happens to be married to me. And she's been married to me for 35 years. And I've heard, I've heard a lot of sermons you've never heard. <laughs> and so... We had a conversation a few weeks ago and I said, you know, I believe God's put a word in you for the men of the house because I said, right now uh, in society, men are getting a pretty rough deal. And you know, if because of the misbehavior of a few men, there's an association that's all men. And unfortunately, a lot of times men become the target of mockery in society and, and a lot of, lot of bad things. And we thought, you know, on Father's Day, men need to have an encouraging word, but I think it would be good coming from the opposite sex, S somebody who would represent uh, the other side of the story. And I thought this would be not only a word for the men of the house, the fathers of the house, but also be a word for the women of the house to learn how to support the man of the house. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. Behind every great man, there's usually a great woman. And I happen to be married to one, and I want you to give a warm welcome to my wife, Colleen Rouse, as she brings the word of God. <laughs> the kiss that went around the world. <laughs> well, good morning, and uh, I know this is all very untoward. I mean... A lot of stuff is going on, like my husband said, with men, and you know, even you have a new Oceans movie that came out, and all the men have been replaced by women, and now this, like what's going on? <laughs> so I don't know if the geological plates are gonna move in the earth today because a woman is preaching on Father's Day, but 
I'm here for the purpose of honoring the men in this house. And I just want to say, like my husband said, gentlemen, you need a break. You know, I love to laugh. Laughter is healing, it's beneficial. But I don't like the sitcoms that I see out there today. And do you know the main reason why? Because it appears that laughter is being used to send a very derogatory message about men. And if you think about the majority of the sitcoms that are out there, how men are personified is not positive. You've been personified as brutes, as womanizers, as just all about your career, as over-feminized, as stupid, incompetent. And it seems like laughter is being used at your expense to convey this message that you are incompetent and unnecessary. And so I'm here today simply to tell you this, that could not be further from the truth. And I believe that God still wants you to lead, and my gender needs to tell your gender that you are needed and valued. And I have a feeling, I have a feeling that I am not just speaking for myself, I have a feeling that there are women in this house, on the campuses, watching online, who feel the same way and who want to stand up and take a stand to honor the men in the house, the fathers and the future fathers. So ladies, take advantage of this moment. Come on, stand up. So we want you to be encouraged and reminded of your value. And I hope to reaffirm you of your identity, your authority, and your role. And I see this beautiful analogy depicted in scripture of your role in the home out of Ephesians 5.23. And it says this, for the husband is the head of his wife. I don't care what society says, society cannot move you from a place that the Word of God gives you, okay? And it takes nothing from me to say that my husband is my head. It helps me, it benefits me, and it blesses me. Come on, sisters, I'm waiting for the amens. <laughs> for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Now I know that this is your leadership role, and I know that we in the body of Christ have had some clarity on what that really means. And I know that we now understand that it is to be done from a place not of domineering, but you're called to lead. And it's beautifully explained to us in the 29th verse of Ephesians 5, where it talks about men don't hate their own bodies, and so there's a way that you take care of yourself, and there's a way that you lead the home, just as Christ does the church. And the description is based on two things, nourishing and cherishing. And as the Lord does this for the church, so you are to do for your family. And so when we talk about the role of Jesus to the church, we see that Jesus occupied a threefold office. He was priest, he was prophet, and he was king. Now I know Jesus is flawless, but guess what guys? You were created in the image of a flawless God. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but what that means is there is so much that God has for you to do in you and to do through you, and you were created for this. And we see this parallel of Jesus to the church and his office and your role in the home. And I just wanna say this though, I feel this is really important because I've been married to a very godly man and a wonderful leader for 35 years. My husband, is the head 
of our home. And I see over these years how he carries the weight of the responsibility for his family and for this church. And I understand this as, as hard as I would try. I, I have no idea. I can't comprehend what it feels like to be a man and to feel the weight of the responsibility that, that you guys feel. We can't understand it. And I'm sure at times it gets very weighty and heavy for you. And so as we unpack this this morning, I am not trying to add to the weight of your sense of responsibility. Because what I do want to tell you is that God didn't just place responsibility on your shoulders without placing an anointing on your life to carry it out. There is a grace for you to lead. There is a grace for you to lead. And what I want you to see as we go through this this morning is the capacity that you have for greatness. Not for average, but for greatness. And when we talk about capacity, we ordinarily think about it from the standpoint of producing. But I want you to understand that capacity also has very much to do with the ability to receive. And as much as maybe society wants to mock you and try to make you as a one-dimensional being, you are not, you are multi-dimensional. And you have this capacity to have this role of priest and prophet and king in your home. So let's look at this because the priest is the mediator. He's, he's the one that represents the family to God. And the prophet, he is the messenger. He's the one that represents God to the family. And thirdly, the king, he's the model. And he offers protection and provision for the family. Now I want to issue this disclaimer because I understand that Women have the opportunity to move in the gifts of the Spirit, to hear from the voice of the Lord, to pray as well. We also have that. We are not excluded from that. And so my intent is not to exclude us from the picture this morning, but my intent is to honor and focus on the men in the house. So if that's okay, ladies, that's the way I'd like to proceed. Amen. So let's, let's look at this closely. Let's talk about the priest, first of all, the mediator, the one who represents the family to God, the one who sanctifies his home. And of all of the components of what it means to be a priest, I want to highlight one particular one. Because you see, the priest is the one that cares for the soul. And so I want to just kind of zone in on the caring component. And I want to mention this because... Sometimes when we talk about the ability to have emotions and be caring and to be nurturing and to be compassionate, sometimes we call that getting in touch with your feminine side. And you know what? That's actually very wrong because it's as if only my gender can claim that. But it couldn't be further from the truth because that is actually getting in touch with your Jesus side. Because Jesus had compassion on the multitudes. And Jesus was the same man who invited little children to come up to him so he could put his arms around them and love on them. But I understand this. This is an area, gentlemen, where you've been somewhat disadvantaged. Because let's talk about when we grew up. Let's talk about when you were a little boy and I was a little girl. You see, as little girls, we're, we're taught it's okay to be vulnerable and it's, it's okay to express your most emotions and exhibit emotions. But as a little boy, when you did it, you were shamed for it. You were taught to stuff your emotions. You were taught that it was masculine to not have emotions. And so that's what you learned. And you know what? What's the price of that? What's the fruit of that? What's well, interesting that right now we seem to have a rash of suicides across the front pages. But I don't know if you're aware of this or not. But men 
are three times, three times as many men commit suicide as women. And maybe somehow that's tied into this, that in this social conditioning, we've been unfair to you. You see, when we cry as women, someone hands us a tissue. When you cry, they take your man card. There's something wrong with this picture. So you've been socially conditioned to suppress your emotions. But here's the good news. You are wired and destined to be another way. It's the way you're wired to have emotions. You have the capacity for greatness because he is great. And you don't have to untrain yourself. You can't untrain yourself. You can't just not be a certain way. But you can come fully into the way that you were always designed to be. If you allow him to be your model, your good, good father. And the beautiful thing that happens when we begin to renew our minds is that it works in conjunction with our original design. God designed you to have emotions. He didn't design you to suppress them. And the more we look to him, the more we become like him. And my Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus was the high priest who was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He had an ability to connect heart to heart with us. And same is true of you. As the priest in your home, you can be touched with the feeling of the infirmities and know how to pray and cover the weaknesses in your home. I think we need a, a different idea of what manhood looks like because Jesus was every bit masculine and he shows us what it looks like to be a man. You see, there is something really important that we have lost in our society. And that is that transition from a boy to a man. If you look through the Bible, you can see that when Jesus transitioned, it is the Jewish culture to honor that, to celebrate that as a holy thing. Now, if we look at our society, the definition of what it means to go from a boy to a man, it's completely different. I don't even, I don't even need to tell you what that looks like. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's entirely the opposite of the way God had intended it to be. And so, more than likely, if I took a poll and I asked you, gentlemen, how many of you were celebrated from boyhood into manhood? How many of you were armed and prepared with the word of God? How many of you looked and studied Proverbs to make this transition? It didn't happen for you, did it? But guess what? It's never too late. It's never too late for you to be celebrated as the godly man that you are. And God wants you to have that. And here's what I love. I love that I see many fathers reinstating this for their sons. And that's who we need to focus on, the sons in the house, that they would be celebrated and understand that it's not just about becoming a male, it's about becoming a man and creating the distinction for them, amen? amen. I love that we are seeing that come back into the family of God. So I wanna say this to you, gentlemen. For you to represent your family, you must be present. You must be present emotionally and spiritually and physically because when you pray, there's something about it when men pray. There's something that is uniquely different when you lift up your voice to pray. There is something about hearing men say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As a man, as a father in your home, as a husband, you want your family to feel safe. And can I tell you this? 
I never feel safer than when I hear my husband pray. There is something about your prayers covering us that makes us feel safe. And you have an anointing as the priest in your home to cover your family. Not only are you a priest, but you're a prophet. And the prophet is the messenger, the one that represents God to the family. And I know sometimes you might not feel very spiritual in comparison to us, because I've heard it, I've heard women say it, I'm more spiritual than my husband. That couldn't be further from the truth. Now we might be more intuitive And I believe the reason for that is we're the ones carrying the babies, and so we need to be intuitive. But you hear the Holy Spirit too. It's just different for you. We just hear and sense the Holy Spirit differently. And so if we have sent the wrong message to you, then I want to retract it. And I want to tell you that you are the prophet in your home, and you do hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. My sheep hear my voice, and you know and can distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit in your home. You see, the prophet is the one that sets the standards and the values in the home. So dad, when you see your teenage daughter come walking down the stairs scantily clad, and you point your finger back up and you say, no, darling, you go up and you put something else on, you're setting a standard of holiness in your home. That's the Holy Spirit working through you. You're not crimping her style, you're raising her standard. And we can't get in the way of that. And now here's what's beautiful is when you combine that prophet role with the priestly role, you know how to speak to her. You know how to cover her in prayer. When you see behavior in your children that alarms you, you know how to go to the Lord and cover them in prayer. And then as a result of your prayer life, the Lord tells you how to speak to them in such a way that they can see. You see, daddy's daughters need you to cover their virtue. My father just threatened me. He understood the prophetic, but he didn't understand. He just did the best with what he had. But there's something beautiful about when you can be priest and prophet to your children. And they sense your caring component. And you have the authority to speak truth. And so as women in the house, we don't want to stand in the way of the men speaking truth and raising the standards in our home. But here's what I know. Men, many men, feel devalued about what they have to say. And I understand how all this unfolds because if you look at polls, this is what men say. That at work, their decisions are not questioned nearly as often as they are at home. So there's something wrong with that picture. And here's what we need to understand. When, when we continually question your decisions, when we try to fix what you're trying to fix, when we do this, it conveys a lack of trust in you. And it says to you that you're incompetent. Now, let me help you out, guys, to understand something a little bit about my gender. You see, there's an area of the brain that notices flaws and things that are wrong, and in the female brain, it just so happens to be larger, okay? <laughs> this is why we can spot that little, that little piece of lint on your jacket, and you're like, what are you doing? Get because of that. Sorry. <laughs> but what we can do is learn to do a better job of checking ourselves and conveying our trust because the reason this bothers you is you are wired to lead. And you want us to trust your knowledge. And you want us to trust your judgment even in the little things. You want us to just let you figure it out. We get it. It's interesting because in our house, Between the two of us, the one of 
us who is more mechanically inclined is me. Because I was raised by a daddy who taught me to build houses. Like, I have laid cinder block. That's right, this little puny chick has laid cinder block. I have done wiring. And so, if something comes to our home that needs to be assembled, I leave the room. <laughs> Sometimes I leave the house. Because I'm watching my husband and I just... <laughs> I just need to let him figure it out. Because it's more important to me what's going on in his soul than the fact that he's got the wrong screwdriver in his hand. Okay. So this explains to us why you guys never stop and ask for directions. You know, we think we're driving to a destination. You're like, we're on a conquest here. We're just gonna figure it out. Thank God for MapQuest and Waze. <laughs> So here's what's been going on with you guys. When we, the way the human brain operates is we tend to collect data. We tend to collect experiences and comments. And we begin to build narratives in our minds. And so if we, as women, fail to communicate trust in you over the little things, then you conclude that we will not trust you in the larger, weightier matters of life. And so we need to check ourselves. We need to understand why do we lack the trust? I can remember in the very early stages of our marriage having issues with this. And I struggled with it. And it wasn't because of my husband. The issue was right here. And I had to go to the Lord and he began to show me that because of the way I was raised, because of the dynamics of my father-daughter relationship, I had built a narrative in my mind that you couldn't trust men. Because of my relationships with men before Christ, I had built that narrative that I couldn't trust men. And so my behavior was based out of this fear and the way it exhibited itself was a need to control. So can I tell you, ladies, if you are like that as well, if you just feel like you have to control things, then you are allowing fear to dominate and manipulate you. But the good news is, you don't have to untrain yourself. You need to renew your mind. And I began to go to the Lord, and I'm telling you what, there is nothing like enjoying the peace that comes from being able to trust the great God in your wonderful husband. And that's what he wants you to have as well. And then there's the king. The king is the model, and he's the one that offers protection and provision for the family. Like we said in Ephesians 5.29, this is where he nourishes and cherishes his household. You see, guys, this is why you care about accomplishing things. This is why if you wake up and you have a sales call that you are going to land this account and you're pumped and you're hyped because you want to conquer something. You're about finding solutions because of the kingly role on your life. This is why when we come to you and we wanna tell you our problems, you're trying to find a solution. And within two seconds, you've got the solution. The problem is we just want you to listen. <laughs> but here's the thing. There is an intelligence that you possess that we must value. And this is the conqueror in you. In fact, I want you to think about this. Hum humanity has been on the earth a long time. And for 90% of human history, men were hunter-gatherers. So you had to stay alert. Because that meant the difference between bringing home a meal or becoming a meal. Now today, 
I don't think any of you went out and had to catch your dinner for tonight because things have changed. But you're still wired that way. You're still wired to hunt. And this explains your behavior when it comes to women. And women are like, why are men always on the prowl? Because they're hunters, okay? And the Bible says, he who finds a wife as a result of hunting her, hello, finds the good thing. So let's not be turned off by the hunter. In fact, if you understand men and understand this about them, it can work to your benefit. For example, my husband will go with me to the mall and I will tell him, honey, we must hunt down a pair of red shoes. <laughs> and so he will come with me and he go, is it this one? No. Is it this one? He's, he's on the prowl. He is going to conquer and con this conquest will be fulfilled. And then when we find the red shoes, and on sale, by the way, when we find the red shoes, I say, we're not done yet. We gotta hunt down a red purse too. Okay, let's find the red purse. You see, when you go to the mall and you see that lonely man sitting on the bench slumped over taking a nap, she forgot to tell him what she was hunting or he would be with her. Y'all are hunters. It explains why you enjoy sports because it's all about the conquest and that, that satisfies the hunter gather in you. It also explains to us why you yell at the TV. <laughs> Even though absolutely no one who can do anything about what you're saying can hear you. And this is why we bring you more nachos, because as long as you're eating, you're not yelling at the TV. <laughs> but I have a question for you. Gentlemen, how much of your time is spent as an observer of sports and not a participator? Again, social conditioning. And it impacts your spiritual life. You see, we need you to be alert. We need you to awaken your curiosity for greater wisdom. And we need you to be a hunter and a pursuer of God and not a spectator of God. You know, when you're sitting there watching Tiger Woods get an eagle on the 18th hole at Augusta, you really can't live vicariously through him. Your heroes do not need to be sports food. LeBron James, I mean, there are some amazing men out there, but can I tell you what we need? We need you to be the hero in our house. And that means you gotta stop being a spectator and be a participator. You see, your wife wants to see you live bigger than yourself. And she longs for this for you. Outside of your natural abilities, you see, to step and to fully embrace this mantle of a king, you need new vision. And the only way this can happen is when you turn the hunt inward. And when you learn how to connect with the Holy Spirit who speaks quietly within. You see, we need you to get off the couch and we need you to get in the game. When you pray, it is powerful. We need to hear your voices lifted up. We want to see your authority rise up and we will cheer you on, gentlemen. We will cheer you on. We need you. We need you because we are in a war. And where there is war, there are two different types of people fighting that war. There are soldiers and there are warriors. You see, a soldier follows orders and they carry out commands because it's required of them. But a warrior is of a different breed. A warrior follows orders and carries out commands because it has gripped him. There is something of a different essence about a warrior. 
And that's who you are. You cannot become a true warrior until you connect with your heart, until you are in that place of pursuing God and not just being a spectator. You see, there's so much more capacity. There's much more for you to receive because God wants you to step into this level of greatness that he called you to. He wants you to fully embrace and experience life and all of the emotion connected with it. And we know that your ability to stand in awe of LeBron James when he makes that basket, that three-pointing from the center of the court, and when we see Messi make a goal, that ability that you have to stand in awe of those men, you need to turn that awe to your God and stand in awe of him. Because when the men, when the men stand in awe of God, the world stands in awe of the men of God. And that's what we need. That's what we need for you to fully embrace all of who Jesus is on the inside of you. And we know this, we know that when the Falcons lost, yes, I'm sorry, I hate to bring it up, but we know that you went into the bathroom and you cried. <laughs> so did we. <laughs> but I think it's time that you lift up your head. I think it's time that you behold him and I think it's time that without shame and hesitation, you begin to pursue your God like nothing else. You see, here's the thing about a king. Maybe you're a very successful businessman, and that's awesome. But God wants to raise you up even more. Because success is about the wealth that you can accumulate. But significance is about the wealth of good that you can accomplish. And so he wants to expand your vision. He wants to do more. There are solutions. There are ideas that he wants to drop in the kings and that he will get glorified for. He's reserving this anointing and wisdom for you, the king. You know, in the Old Testament, when the priest and the prophet and the king, when they stepped into their office, there was a special ceremony, and there was a common denominator in all of those, and that was that oil was poured over their head, and it was symbolic of the anointing that was coming on their life, the empowering of the Holy Spirit in a very special ceremony. And it was an indication that God would reign through those he has anointed. And can I tell you that that is still true today. God wants to reign through his anointed men. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, just like Saul, it turned him into another man. Now, everything that I shared with you is beautifully summed up in this passage that I want to read to you. The passages are in Psalm 112. And gentlemen, this is talking about you. So if you don't mind, I'd like to read this over you. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who stands in awe of him, who delights greatly in his commands. His descendants, they will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, 
trusting in the Lord, his heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. Gentlemen, today we want to honor you. We want to celebrate you. And we want to affirm you. And we're grateful that you are fully embracing the mantle on your life as priest and prophet and king. And we just want to acknowledge that we see that not only are you soldiers, but you are warriors. And we appreciate that. So we would like for the men in the house, the fathers and the future fathers, would you just stand up so we can honor you. Not bad for a woman, right? That was pretty good. I, uh, I told Colleen, I said, sometimes men need to hear a woman say, keep standing, guys. Don't, don't sit down. I'm not done with you yet. I got something I want to speak over you. But I said, sometimes a man needs to hear a woman say that to him. And this is a good word for the wives and the women of this house. We need to stop criticizing and we need to start encouraging the men in our house. Amen. We're not, we're not at enemies with our, I, when I married Colleen, I said, usually, usually a strong man will marry a weak woman and a strong woman will marry a weak man. And it just so happens I married a strong woman and we're both strong. So we got a whole lot of warrior going on in the house. <laughs> but one of the things that I've learned is no matter how much we challenge each other, she's always there to support me, even when I don't always do things the right way. But I think what she said was important, men, because I think a lot of us did not have a man, a father, a figure necessarily to speak God's word over our lives when we were growing up. And so now we're kind of in recovery mode. We're trying to recover what God intended for us to become. And so I want you to just lift your hands to the Lord, all you men in the house, and see a man, a real man can lift his hands without wrath, without doubt, and he's not embarrassed to lift his hands to the Lord because he knows that God is God and he is not God. <laughs> see, a man who can't lift his hands thinks he's God. But when a man lifts his hands, he knows there is a God that's greater than him, that without God, he is nothing, he can do nothing, he will ever be anything. But because you are God, Lord, you see these men lifting their hands. We ask you right now, and I pray over these men right now, God, as a father figure. I just pray the blessing of the Lord over these men. I speak favor over their life, God, and I call into them the greatness of Jesus, the life of Christ to take over their life, to move them out of the reclining chair of life into the game of life. I thank you for moving them from watching to actually living in the fullness of God. Break every spirit of lukewarmness, half-heartedness, abandonment off of them right now and produce in them a new passion for Jesus, a new passion for the things of God to lead in society, to lead in their homes. The Bible says that the world is waiting for the revelation of the men of God. And I pray, Lord, that you will reveal in them new vision, new purpose, a higher calling, begin to expand them in their dreams and their reason, their, their ability to believe you for bigger things. I pray for an expansion of their heart, Lord, to trust you more. And I thank you for new faith to conquer, to go forward into this world. And as for me and my house to have that attitude, we will serve the Lord in our homes. And I pray for the life of Jesus to be upon them as a father and as a husband and as a man of God leading and modeling society the way Christ you intended for us to do it. Lord, let your anointing now move us from malehood to manhood to, into a new place where we are putting away childish things and we are entering into the new level of maturity that you've called our men to become. I speak that over them and I call them out 
of childish behavior into a life of maturity with you, Christ, to live for you, to serve you, and to be the leader and warrior that you've called them to be. We thank you for these things, and we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. And let's begin to praise him right now, Lord. We thank you for our men.